All right. So today we have Lindsay Anyone here. Have eyes on hot? I will turn off that. Sorry. We have Lindsay here with us who is from Blossom Behavioral Solutions. She is going to be, like I said, going over a topic that interested a ton of parents. I think out of all of our community collab sessions that we had scheduled this year, this is the one that had the most registrants, um, people who registered. So it was clearly a high demand for getting support in this area for our kiddos. Um, so I know we're all really excited to hear what you have to say. Lindsay, I'll let you take it away. Sounds good. Thank you, Carrie. I am excited to be here today. Um, I am going to present on some strategies to assist your child in managing big emotions and helping them build their skill set. I know this is a big topic with kids experiencing many different emotions, and sometimes they can become very overwhelming for parents to deal with and for the child to deal with too. And oftentimes these emotions can affect the child's behaviors. So being able to connect those big emotions to the behaviors you might be seeing in the home and some strategies to help with how to help de-escalate them and teach them ways to cope with those big emotions. So just so everyone knows, my name is Lindsay Lindquist. I'm a board certified behavior analyst and certified clinical trauma specialist. I'm the owner of Boston Behavioral Solutions in Fort Mill, South Carolina. I provide trauma-informed applied behavior analysis, therapy with children, adolescents, and young adults, utilizing a focused approach. And what that means is I provide the ABA treatment directly with a child or adolescent or a young adult as well. Um, and in addition, I also provide parent coaching services to help educate and teach parent strategies to manage their child's behaviors or just even to build their skill set. A lot of times ABA can be focused on behavior reduction um, but I like to focus on how you can build your own skill set, even as parents, to achieve those goals for yourself and for your children. So today we're going to go over some understanding of different emotions and their influence on those undesired behaviors you might be seeing in your child. Um, identifying variables that might impact your child's behavior, both internal variables such as like thoughts and feelings, as well as external variables, which can be anything in the environment. And then learning strategies to help your child manage their emotions. And then we'll wrap up and have a Q&A session at the end. I love having discussions, so feel free to jump in anytime with any questions or any thoughts or statements. So to start, let's talk about emotions. So what are emotions? Emotions are a feeling or a mental state that you are in that is brought on or influenced by the situation you are in or the people you are with. Emotions can be associated with behavior responses, thoughts, and feelings. And I wanted to start by clarifying what those emotions are at the beginning of this presentation as we're going to be talking about emotions and their impact on behaviors. And in the title of the presentation, I want to be able to focus on what those big emotions are. So we have the general emotions, which we'll go over in a couple of slides. And with the big emotions, that's where we have these different emotions like happy, sad, angry, scared that are all very normal. But what can happen is they can trigger into bigger responses. So you might go and see these big meltdowns or outbursts um, that can affect your child and you as well, understanding how to be able to manage some of those in the home when they get to the point where it feels unmanageable. So I wanna start off by a short video just to describe um, this parent's perspective on responding to your kids with big feelings. It's about us being comfortable, being calm and confident. I keep using those words because I think so many parents of young, young children, we have like two speeds. We either go in and we're really, really overly empathetic and kind and then we're not really sure how to set the boundary or we come in and we, and we try to be kind, but the moment that that child doesn't get on board with whatever we want to happen, then we get really strict and, and sort of controlling and forceful. And if we don't want to get forceful, it's like we don't know what to do after that. And so how can I come in and be, and this goes for everybody that has a child that maybe is a little more reactive than, than they're used to. If your kid has emotions that seem like they're too much, how are you taking that in? Like, what face are you showing 
to your kids? Are you showing someone that feels completely overwhelmed by that and afraid? Because that'll make a child go, well, if you can't handle my emotions, how am I going to handle them? Right? They're not, they're not saying that or thinking that those words actually, but that's, that's what's happening, right? They sense that fear in you. They sense that you don't know what to do. And here's the thing, we don't, sometimes we don't know what to do. Sometimes I didn't know what to do with my kid. And it was like, I'm just gonna be here and be calm with you until this moment passes. Cause I know that I can't engage, that's making it harder. I know that I can't walk away. You don't want me to leave, but you have to finish out this loop, this neurological feedback loop that's happening. It's about us. Does anyone have any questions on that video before we continue on? Okay. So the six basic emotions to get started with are sadness, anger, fear, disgust, joy, and excitement. So these six basic emotions are developed at such a young age where internally these children know what these feelings are inside of them. And they may not know exactly what it is, but these are the six basic emotions that children experience. And they're normal for children, adults, adolescents to experience these emotions. And a lot of times, depending on the environment, it almost may seem to the child that it's not okay to exhibit some of these emotions or have some of these emotions. And the biggest piece of advice too is to be able to validate those emotions in your child and help teach them how to express it in a more appropriate way. Um, I guess if we want to use the term appropriate, um, because sometimes what happens is they have these feelings and they don't know what to do with it. So that's where it can turn into those outbursts or those meltdowns because they don't have the skills on how to regulate those emotions. And regulating emotions is a learned behavior. So it's not one that they automatically know how to do. So if they're not taught how to regulate those emotions, they're not going to be able to know, which can be frustrating for adults. You see these children who are maybe tantruming in the store or getting frustrated with their homework assignment because they don't know how to manage their own internal thoughts and feelings. So it's up to us as adults to be able to help teach them to be able to build their skill set to get the outcome that we want as parents, but also for them to help to help them succeed in achieving their goals and be successful later on in life. So going deeper, if an individual is triggered, their nervous system enters into fight, flight, freeze, or fawn. Um, when this happens, you're most likely to see some unwanted behaviors. So if there's an environmental stimuli, um, the individual can be triggered to go into any one of those states. And for one person with that same trigger, they might go into fight and someone else might go into freeze. So it differs based on how the individual's nervous system responds. And I wanted to draw this to light because what we see with fight, flight, and freeze are different behaviors that you might often be seeing in your child at home in the community or at school. So some behaviors that are associated with fight mode are hitting, kicking, yelling, screaming, biting, threats, swearing. Some behaviors associated with flight mode are running away, engaging in a different activity that, than what is expected, lying, fidgeting, climbing, hiding, anything to get away from that trigger. Freeze mode can be isolating, not speaking or responding. So if you're placing a demand on a child and requiring them to respond, sometimes they shut down and freeze where they can't speak. Staring off into space like daydreaming, difficulty with making decisions, withdrawing from the social activities or the activity they're engaging in, or having a difficult difficulty trying new things. And to bring these to light, everybody's triggers are different. And what I hear sometimes from parents or educators is they're making a choice to engage in a behavior. They're choosing to hit. They're choosing to lie. They're choosing to not respond to me. And that is not true if they are triggered and their nervous system is dysregulated. 
So understanding that their nervous system is dysregulated, that is leading to some of these behaviors, is going to help us be able to teach them those skills to regulate, to then teach them the skill on what they need in that moment. Um, Because teaching when you're in fight, flight, freeze, or fawn, their brain is not able to effectively learn. So first and foremost, we have to get them down to a regulated state before the learning can happen. Um, Because ultimately, we want to teach them those skills. We want them to follow through with that instruction that we might be giving them. We want them to continue on with maybe cleaning up or engaging in that effective communication. But if they can't, trying to teach them and pushing them in those moments are pushing them more into a dysregulated state. So first, we have to learn how to regulate the nervous system. And we see that we talked about with the fight, flight, freeze, they lead to some of these behaviors that you might be seeing. So what is a behavior? It's a way in which someone acts in response to a stimulus in the environment, and it's any observable action. Most often people look at the negative behaviors like hitting, lying, tantrum, but a behavior can be anything that you're doing that is observable. It could be drinking water, walking. Um, And in behavior analysis, we talk about behaviors as passing the dead man's test. So a behavior is anything, any observable action that a dead man would not be able to do, um, which will help us be able to define and understand what those behaviors are. And looking deeper into how those internal thoughts and feelings can affect those behaviors that you might be seeing on the outside. And we want to be able to decrease those unwanted behaviors like hitting, lying, um, destruction. But not only do we want to focus on decreasing those, we need to teach a replacement skill. If you're focused on, we need to get this behavior to stop and not teaching the skill in replacement, they're not going to know what to do in the future. So here are some external variables and internal variables that can impact a child's behavior and emotions as well. For external variables, we have social influence. That can be peer pressure, um, expectations from others, including teachers, um, society, cultural norms. Um, We also have social media that can be influencing a child's behavior, siblings, um, parents. We have environment the weather, temperature, noise, privacy, lighting, all of these different factors can influence the behavior, whether we might realize it or not. Um, Some kids can be more sensitive to noise. Some kids can be more sensitive to lighting or temperature. And in those states, it can trigger those behaviors. Think about on a really, really hot day, maybe it's 95 degrees out and you're at the park and you've been there for 30 minutes and the child starts to get frustrated and more irritable on the outside, the weather could be influencing it because they're hot. They don't feel good. They're ready to go. Um, Economic, finances and access to resources can also impact um, the child's behavior. And then we have internal variables. So those are thoughts and feelings, past experiences, illness, or medical So internal variables we often don't see, and a lot of times we can forget that um, when children are engaging in these behaviors. We see the behavior and we don't want it to be happening, or we get frustrated that it's happening. We want them to follow through with our instruction or getting their homework done, but internally they could be tired. They could be having the thought that this is too hard. I can't do this. Uh, Maybe they were told that they were terrible at getting a specific homework assignment done. And that can impact the current moment and how they're able to navigate through that. Illness um, can impact those behaviors as well. Sometimes I see, especially with working with kids for a long period of time, I've noticed patterns with illness where internally they might start to be feeling ill and those external symptoms like the runny nose or the cough haven't started yet. But I see that the behaviors have started to increase a couple weeks, like two to three weeks before these external symptoms appear. So as soon as I start to see that, I'm like, oh, this child is starting to get sick because it's been the same pattern over the past three years. 
Um, so even being able to notice signs like that, maybe they don't feel good. And as a child, they may not be able to push through it as much as us adults are able to. But thinking about it, if we're not feeling good, do we want to be going to work? Do we want to be doing these things that we don't have to do? Or do we want to be doing these things that we have to do, but we don't feel good enough to do it and maybe have to do it anyway? So then understanding behaviors. We have the antecedent, which is what comes before the behavior the behavior and the consequence. So when we just went over those internal and external variables, that goes into the antecedent. So what is occurring before the behavior happens? So how we respond to the behavior can impact the future occurrence of the behavior, internal variables and the behavior itself. So various strategies can be used antecedently to help prevent the behavior from escalating. Now, is it gonna work 100% of the time? Probably not, but we can implement these strategies ahead of time to help decrease the likelihood of the behavior occurring just by how we respond when the behavior happens. If they're getting reinforcement for the behavior, um, say they have a tantrum because they were told no and they get that item that they were told no to um, in the first place, the behavior is more likely to happen again when they're told no. But if we work through strategies to help in those situations de-escalate and regulate when the behavior happens without necessarily giving them that item that they were told no in the first place because we do have boundaries we have to set and follow through with that are there to help the child and you as a family. We can help shape that behavior in that tolerance with, for instance, being told no. Uh, does anyone have any questions on this slide? So some behavior management strategies that we can take ahead of time are providing reinforcement for those desired behaviors that you see. And this is also a consequent strategy as well because we think that behaviors don't necessarily have to be negative, they can be positive as well, like drinking water or communicating effectively. So providing that reinforcement for the desired behaviors is going to help the likelihood that those behaviors will continue in the past. That can look like maybe they were told no to having the candy in the grocery store the one time, they tolerated it, you walked out the store, got to the car, and they were still showing those desired behaviors. Sometimes you have to reinforce that, hey, you showed me all the right behaviors, you did awesome accepting that you couldn't have that piece of candy, let's go back in and get it. Now, you're not going to do that every time, but one thing that people often miss, especially with tolerance of accepting no, is they never reinforce the no, the tolerance of accepting no. It's always a no, and they never get the item. So that's where some of the behaviors with accepting no can start to increase. If you're constantly told no, and you never get that item that you really want, those behaviors are going to keep happening. Providing positive reinforcement can be praise, and you want to be specific with the praise, not just, good job, you did it, but be specific. You did great completing your homework assignment. You now have the rest of the evening to play. So drawing that attention to now you have all this free time because you did the things that you were supposed to do. Um, and Reinforcement is different for everybody. Some kids love praise and thrive off of praise and it's reinforcing to them. Other kids, it can be more punishing if they get praise. So it might stop the behavior from happening. Um, sometimes people like high fives, hugs, um, toys, items. And we want to try and align that reinforcement with what that behavior is. Um, that you want to see. So what is going to be related to it versus something that's completely unrelated? We want to provide clear expectations. If there's not clear expectations in the environment, it can increase anxiety for the child. They're not sure what to expect. They don't understand what it was that you were asking of them. And also getting their attention before placing a task or a demand that you might have for them. Sometimes using visual schedules can be really helpful. That can look like these are the expectations for the evening. We get home, we put our backpacks and shoes up, we eat our snack, we do our homework, we have dinner, and your bedtime routine. 
um, providing explanations. So instead of just saying no, well, no, we can't do this right now because of this. Here's when we can do it. Um, oftentimes I see a child's wanting a snack. No, you can't have that snack. Why? Because I said so. No, I said no. Instead of helping them understand the why, um, a lot of times it can be frustrating for a child to question, well, why constantly? But being able for a child to be able to question why is actually a really good skill. So there's having the child ask why to learn more information about why I can't have this. These are the boundaries and then following through with those boundaries. Now, if they repetitively are asking the why, that's where we can work through some other strategies on how to redirect during that time because they were given the why um, and now we have to work on that tolerance and acceptance. And then another strategy is one task at a time. Um, kids developmentally can't manage many tasks at a time, especially the younger kiddos. Um, most often, one-step instructions can be really hard for a child to follow, especially if that one instruction requires a lot of effort. Um, say you need them to clean up all of their toys. Okay, you need to clean up your room. Well, it could be you need to make your bed. You need to pick up all the clothes and put them in the laundry basket. You have toys all over your floor. So that cleaning the room is now multiple different instructions. So being able to help them understand, okay, let's start by pick up all the laundry and put it in your hamper. Now let's tackle the next activity because placing too many demands can eventually shut the child down. And then none of them are getting done. And here's some strategies to help manage the emotions. And this is more of those consequence-based strategies like we talked about with the ABC. So the consequence is what comes after the behavior. And consequence doesn't mean punishment because sometimes you can associate consequence as a punishment. And a lot of times I get parents who ask me, well, what is the consequence for that? Um, referring to, well, what is the punishment? What's taken away? Where's the time out? Where's the spanking? Um, but consequence is anything that happens after the behavior that will either increase the behavior or decrease the behavior. And oftentimes punishment strategies like timeouts, spanking, taking things away, increase the behavior in the future instead of decrease, which is what we want to happen in that future, especially for those negative behaviors. Um, so we want to co-regulate, validate, and model. Co-regulation promotes self-regulation and allows children to feel secure, builds their skill set, and fosters child development. Children don't have innately that skill to regulate. They have to be taught how to regulate, and that starts with co-regulation, and that's where you help them regulate through those emotions, regulate their nervous system, because they cannot do it on their own. And sometimes we forget that. We forget that kids can't regulate on their own, so then they're exhibiting these big behaviors and breakdowns, um, outbursts. We want to validate your child's feelings. Um, an example is, I see that you're really frustrated that you can't have the ice cream right now. So you're validating that that emotion is okay, but you're still setting the boundary as a parent. You're not just, okay, they're tantruming, now I'm gonna give you that ice cream. It's still a boundary that you can't have this right now, and that's okay that it makes you feel really frustrated. A lot of times I see um, children engaging in behaviors and their adults are quick to say, you're okay, you're okay. And in the child's mind, that can be contradictory because internally they don't feel okay. So telling them they're okay invalidates those feelings that are internally happening that we can't see. We also want to model. Modeling is a crucial strategy as kids are watching and learning as they are developing. Um, one of the skills that they learn early on is imitation. So imitation is where they copy what's going on in the environment. That is how they learn the skills that we want them to have or as they're growing they're learning because they're imitating what's going on around them in the environment so if they're seeing um, more harmful strategies or if they're seeing the yelling if they're seeing other kids hitting they're likely to do that as well 
So we have to be able to model for our kids. We get frustrated as adults, we get angry as adults, or we get sad. So modeling how we handle our own emotions as adults is going to help them see how to effectively handle it. And sometimes we're not going to be perfect. It is not possible to be perfect 100% of the time. But that's where that consequence comes in after the behavior. Maybe you got frustrated and you yelled at your child. Going back and being able to apologize to your child to show them that empathy of mommy or daddy did this wrong today. I should have done this instead. I was feeling frustrated. Will help not only reestablish that connection that you may have lost in that moment, but teach them that empathy. Teach them this is what could have been done in that moment. And this is a quote that I always love to share. An escalated adult cannot regulate a dysregulated child. If you are escalated as an adult, trying to regulate the child only turns into, like we see in this picture, a potential yelling match. If you are yelling and you're at your child not to yell, but they're seeing you yell, it's confusing for them. Um, maybe you walk away from your child who really needs you. They're seeing that, okay, I engaged in this behavior and now my parent is walking away. So I don't have that support. I don't have that connection, which can lead to potential thoughts of I'm a bad child. Nobody likes me. Nobody wants to be around me. So as adults, it's important to regulate yourself to be able to help regulate your child. So going more into co-regulation, co-regulation is, some strategies for that is a calming presence of tone of voice. So using that calming voice um, instead of that stern voice or a high level um, voice as well. Coming down to more of a whisper voice can be really helpful. Um, getting on their level, especially if they're yelling. Um, so if they're yelling, let's try and get down to and model that quieter tone of voice because it'll help draw their attention to that. Getting on their level instead of standing above them, let's get on their level. Let's validate their emotions. Sometimes it's not even speaking at all. Um, and you can see this with younger kids, older kids, where if you're trying to continuously give them those demands or validate and speak with those emotions, if their brain is not at a point for learning, sometimes it's escalating them further into that state. So sometimes it is. You just sit on their level where you're showing that you're there when they're ready for you to be there. Um, if they're wanting to go take that space, allow them that space, but let them know that you're there. Um, so when they're ready to come back around, being able to be there for them will help, help establish that connection. Uh, modeling deep breathing. And I like to do this with all ages as well. If someone is starting to escalate, I'm just going to sit here and model breathing in and breathing out. I'm not placing any demands. I'm just modeling what we can do in those moments. Um, now, some people will say, stop doing that or stop breathing. And that's where we want to respect that in the moment because they're communicating, I don't want this right now. So being able to respect that, that is not what's helping them in that moment. Um, providing hugs if the child consents to that as well. Sometimes they might pull away. So that's where we want that hands-off approach um, to be able to respect that their body is not ready to be touched. And sometimes after they're ready to come around and give the hug or sometimes they just don't like that and that's okay. To validate, we want to validate the child's emotions and that can look like, I see that you're frustrated right now that you're not getting your way. I know that it feels very scary for you when mommy drops you off at school and leaves. Oh, this work feels very difficult for you right now. Our language can have such an impact on a child's behavior, um, all ages as well with that one. Um, how we communicate, the language that we're portraying, will help them as well. If they're constantly hearing very fixed or rigid language, that's what they're gonna internalize. But if they see that flexibility, if they see the expansion of the language, it's gonna help them build their communication um, skill set as well. And then modeling. 
So we want to model the behaviors you want to see. And this can look like expressing your own emotions when you're frustrated. If you've had a long day at work, if you feel like you can't deal with whatever's going on at home in the moment, express to your kids, I need a break right now. Can anyone help me out with this? Um, especially as your kids are getting older too, there's going to be more tasks that they're able to help you out with. And they'll see, okay, mom or dad is feeling overwhelmed right now. Here's what I can do to help them. Okay, when they're feeling overwhelmed, mom and dad help me out too. Engage in behaviors you want your child to see and exhibit. This can be self-care, completing chores and tasks, effective communication. If you're never doing the dishes and constantly leaving your dishes out or things around the house, but you're expecting your child to do it and clean up all their things and do the dishes right away, but you're not doing it, it's confusing for your child. So having those expectations for yourself as well as those expectations where they're similar for your child is making sure that it's age and developmentally appropriate as well. Um, you shouldn't be expecting a four-year-old to vacuum unless they love vacuuming and really want to do that chore. Um, so as your children are getting older, they're able to do more skills. They're able to do harder tasks um, and being able to modify those for your younger kids as well. And then practicing deep breathing and emotional regulation strategies without placing it as a demand. If your child's dysregulated and crying or having a big outburst, if you say, stop, take a deep breath, you're okay. In those moments, they're likely to resist that. No, I'm not taking a deep breath. I'm not doing it. Uh, because in the moment, their brain can't even process what's going on. So now you're adding on an additional demand, which can shut the brain down. But being able to model it and practice those strategies when they're in a regulated state is going to be really helpful, um, especially when it comes to building their skill set. Practicing skills when the behavior is happening or when they're in a dysregulated, stressed out state, you're not going to get very far. It's very important to be able to go back at a different time to be able to work through some of these skills that need to be built. Um, to be able to help them succeed when their brain is able to process, learn, and learn those strategies. And that's where it comes in with building their toolbox. In order to increase your child's skill set, you must focus on teaching functional, valuable skills to equip them with the right tools. So the more that we help children build their toolbox, the more they're going to be able to draw from when they're in a dysregulated state. Um, one visual I like is thinking of the brain as you have different islands and there's different skills on each island. Maybe you have communication, emotional regulation, social skills on different islands, and you have bridges between all of those islands. But when they are triggered and going into a dysregulated state, those bridges start to break down. So they have less access to those islands to be able to pull from. So the more that we're able to build their skill set, the more they're going to be able to draw from those islands before those bridges start to break down. And even if they start to break down, there's still going to be more tools on those islands for them to be able to access. So some skills that are important to increase from a socio-emotional and behavioral standpoint are emotional regulation, functional communication, um, identifying emotions, and acceptance and flexibility. And with acceptance and flexibility, that can look like waiting, accepting no, tolerating change, communication. Sometimes it's going to be okay for your child to say no and for us to be able to respect that. But then learning, okay, now is not the right time. Um, communication can look like I need more time with my game before I do my homework. Um, I need a break. Um, this is what I need right now to be able to expand on that communication. So the more that we're increasing their language and communication, the more they're going to be able to communicate during times of distress or big emotions. Um, and we want to be able to reinforce that communication because if we're never reinforcing that communication, they're not going to use it. So if they're asking for more time and it's always a no, you can't have more time, they're never going to then ask for more time. It's going to potentially turn into that outburst when they're told, you can't have your video games right now. You need to get off of it and go do your homework. Um, so being able to honor within reason. Maybe it's just two more minutes because it gives them that autonomy and feels like they have some control 
but that control is back on you as a parent because you're able to regulate that and still set those boundaries. So allowing for them to have that autonomy while you still have that respect as a parent and those boundaries set. And that's especially as important as kids are getting older. You want to set those boundaries from a young, younger age and they can still be set at an older age as they're still learning and growing. But being able to reinforce those positive skills while still having those boundaries as a parent, because you're there to help teach and protect them, but allow them to building that self-management and autonomy, because when they get to be adults, those are going to be skills that are going to be very important for them to have, especially when you think about in the workplace or when they're off on their own, what skills are they going to do without you there? And then there's times where we do want to seek professional help. So sometimes professional help is needed. And here's a few key signs for when you should seek professional help for your child and child and family. So if your child has thoughts of self-harm or harming others, um, if your child requests that professional help, so that's them acknowledging, I need help. There's something going on internally that I would like some help with. If their behaviors continue to increase, if you are feeling overwhelmed and unable to provide that effective support. So we going back to that slide where we talked about if you are dysregulated as an adult, it's going to be hard for you to help your child regulate. So if you're feeling overwhelmed with everything going on, it could be helpful for your child to also receive that support. And then at any point, if you feel like your child would benefit from it, there doesn't always have to be a problem for you to go and seek that support. Sometimes using it as an antecedent strategy of, Let's get this going. I know there's going to be a big life transition coming up in the next year or so. So let's have the child start to be able to build that skill set ahead of time before those things start to happen in their life, which can impact the behavior as long term. So now we have some conclusion and questions. And just for a disclaimer, the informa information provided is to serve as education on emotions and behaviors and is not a medical diagnosis or treatment. All the education follows my code of ethics with the BACB. If I'm unable to answer any specific questions, I will provide a resource to guide you in a better direction to get the information that you might need. Thank you, Lindsay. Um, I know that was a lot of information. I saw lots of kind of nodding heads and people jotting things down as you were talking. So mm -hmm. real positive signs. Um, at this time, I'm gonna stop the recording and then we will open it up to the Q&A.